Thank you, Miss Shannon. Yeah. Can't praise him enough. Right. We have a reason to praise him. Yeah. He's worthy yeah. of our praise. I love it. Love that. Right. Mount Mark chapter 15 in your Bibles. Mark chapter 15. I'm going to read verses 13 through 25. Most of the message is really about verse 21 through 25. It's, it's just too good not to read it all. Please stand in honor of reading God's Word. Hope you brought your Bible today. Amen? Read your Bible. So Jesus has already been tried. Verse 13, the crowd is crying out again to have him crucified. They cried out again, crucify him. Then Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? They cried out the more exceeding, crucify him. So Pilate, willing to content, which means to yield to or please the people, released Barabbas, by the way, was a murderer, unto them and delivered Jesus. And when he had scourged him, he sent him away to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium. They called together the whole band, which means they gathered every body around there that they could to mock Jesus Christ, to, to, to uh, see it. They clothed him with purple, which represents majesty. They did that to make fun of him. Planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. They smote him on the head with a reed and spit on him, bowed their knees and worshipped him. When they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him, led him out to crucify him. They compelled one, Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. They bring him unto the place called Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of the skull. They gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. I'm going to stop right there because this is not the message today. But if my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ can deny alcohol hanging on the cross, you could deny it. Yeah. Amen. 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 And when they crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them to what every man should take. It was the third hour, and they crucified him. God help us today. Amen. You know who's here? God, you know who's here that's never been saved, never been born again, that's never admitted that they're a sinner and ask you into their heart. God, I pray you use this message to bring families together, God's sons and, and, and dads and moms and their daughters. God, whatever it takes, God, uh, to uh, restore the family. Yes. And so, God, we love you. Thank you. Bind Satan away from this message. He's not welcome here. He's a liar, murder, and a thief. We reject him by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. 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 So <clears throat> we're going to skip all the way to verse 21. So they compelled Simon a Cyrenian who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Now that may not mean a whole lot to you today. And maybe, and maybe I guess that's maybe the reason God has led in this direction. Uh, these are his sons. These are his sons, and imagine what Simon went through. And maybe this is what we need to do, because every time Jesus stopped trying to carry the cross, and he helped him, carried it for him quite a bit. Via Del Rosa Rosa, half a mile long after being tortured to the point of death. Could you imagine following Jesus so close that when he stopped, you stopped. When he goes, you go. That's what happened to him. To Simon. He followed him closely. He helped him closely. And enough to be an example. Now get this. To be an example to his sons. Alexander and Rufus. Can you imagine the story when he got home? I can't find it in the scriptures. But I know God used this in the life of his two sons. Because you look over the book of Romans 16.13, it said, Paul said, Salute Rufus. He's chosen in the Lord. 
Can you imagine the difference you all it would make in your families if all the fathers could come home and said, I've had an experience with Jesus Christ. Amen. Her mom comes home and says, I've had an experience with Jesus Christ and it changed my life. Amen. Amen. And it changes your life for the better. Amen. Amen. Not for the worse. I can, I can just picture him coming home and getting to share what that he saw. <coughs> As a people, as he carried that cross, and then he carried it for Jesus, and they spit on him, and they hurled accusations at him as he was walking a half a mile away. But never yet did he revile against one person. He never yelled back at one person. In other words, us old timers say he sucked it up <coughs> for us. Can you imagine that experience, walking that close to Jesus Christ? He's actually called us to do that, y'all. Listen to what Matthew 16, 24 says. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Taking up your cross doesn't sound like it's very easy, does it? Amen? And I'm not talking about the kind that you wear around your neck. That people do and they live a, god, a godless life wearing a gigantic cross around their neck. Something about that y'all ain't right. Yep. It ain't right. Turn now to Judges chapter 6. I'm going to read you something here and I want you to, I want you to understand it. If I've set you with what I'm about to preach, I want you to hear what Paul said as he spoke to the church in Corinth, Corinth, 2 Corinthians 7, 8. Paul said, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle has made you sorry, though it were for a season. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry. And I'm the same way. I don't want to make anybody sorry that you came today. And I don't want to come here and point fingers. I can't do that. Because if I point one at you, there'll be four pointed back at me. But that you were sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage in a, by us in nothing. Paul said, for godly sorrow works repentance through salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works dead. And so as I was talking to the pastors, getting ready for the great revival, and we began to talk to each other over the past couple of months, and it's been planned for longer than that. The Bible school theme came up, and here's, here's what was told me. One pastor said, we had 20 kids at vacation Bible school, and the last night that we had an opportunity for everybody to come in and see all the things that their children did. Two parents showed up. That's what America looks like, y'all. Amen. Two parents showed up to represent 20 children made in the image of God. That breaks my heart, Brother Greg. I don't know about you, I go back to my childhood, and that's a long time ago. Amen. <laughs> but I can go back to when I was a child, and I was so proud if my mom and dad ever came to see me do anything. And I'd hunt them down when I was in the dugout at baseball or I was on the ball field. I'd look for them when they showed up. Here's mom and dad. I'm good to go. I may not have a hit today and the ball may hit me in the head. It has several times. But mom and dad's here with me. We're missing at you all. And y'all know I'm telling you the truth. Amen. And I thank God for the parents that showed up here. But I want you to, you know, we, we got to look, we got to be real about things. We had 40 children, and most, most of the time, a little over 40. And when it came tonight for rewards and to see everything that the children did, we might have had 10 couples here. And those of you that came, praise God for you. Amen. Those of you that couldn't get here because you work and other things, you can't help that. 
For those of you that decide that, that your child's spiritual life is the least important thing to you, then you need to get saved. Amen. You need Jesus Christ in your heart. Amen. Your child needs to be able to say, Mom and Dad came to see me learn about Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Turn your Bibles to Judges chapter 6. So the question would be today is, parents, where are you? Where are you today, parents? God had raised up a man named Gideon in Judges chapter 6 to save the nation Israel. And God, as He usually does quite often, He sometimes sends us an angel to confirm what He's called us out to do. And He did that here in these passages. And so Gideon takes notice of that in verse 22 of Judges chapter 6. So it said, When Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, because I've seen an angel of the Lord face to face. The Lord said to him, Peace be with thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Now you're about to see an example here where that the child, the son, sets an example for the father. You're gonna, I hope you get this. Gideon built an altar there to the Lord. He called it Jehovah Shalom unto this day, which means the Lord is peace. Unto this day, it's yet as it, it's in Oprah, not the Oprah you know about, of the Abyssalites. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, Now here's what, here's what he's told to do Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock, seven years old. In other words, hitch up to these two cattle, these two bulls, whatever they are, and I want you to tear up the throne, I want you to tear up the image of Baal that's in your father's house. He even had an altar there. Throw down the altar of Baal that thy father has cut down the grove, and, and cut down the grove by it. Now Baal was an idol of prostitution, Baal was an idol of death for newborns, firstborn children, and for the abandonment of children. That is the one we spoke many times about how they would put children to death by a gigantic bronze statue. They'd build a fire in and they'd lay the little children at the end of the arms of the, of the statue and the fire would heat up all the way through into the hands of this giant bronze statue and it would incinerate. It would burn the babies to death. And this man, Gideon's father, had an altar in his home to worship this God. God sometimes uses children to clean up mom and daddy's house. And he did it right here. I'll come back to that. And then he said, when you do this, build an altar to the Lord thy God on the top of this rock. In the ordered place, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice of the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. What he's saying there is that look, until you until you can save the nation Israel, get in, your own home needs to be cleaned up. Your own home has sin in it, your own home has idol worship going on in your home. And I hear that I hear it all the time, you all, all the time. This is what America needs. This is what America needs. This is what America needs. This is what Simsonia needs. This is what Benzora needs. God is letting us know through this passage of scripture that you need to get your home cleaned up. And Brother Mike needs to make sure his is cleaned up. Or we can never see this nation ever, ever turned around. Amen. And it starts inside of you and me. Amen. You want to see Congress straightened up? See more congressmen saved. Amen. Gee, that's complicated, Brother Mike. No, it really isn't. Amen? Amen. You want to see the state of representatives, your senators? You want to see all them straightened up? See that the gospel is presented to them until they accept Christ. But when you truly accept Jesus Christ, you're changed. Amen. <laughs> we become new creatures. Little Miss Allie that came 
the Sunday school gave her heart and soul to Jesus. And we've been double checking with her and making sure of the work that God had done in her heart. We want to make sure she really understood what she did. And you know, one comment that keeps that coming up from Allie? Something's changed. Something's changed in that little girl. That's Jesus. He's the only one who can change anybody. Amen. 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 So if you want to see things change, it has to happen inside out. Then it, then it will spread out all over the communities. That's the way God works. So let me ask you today, what are your idols? Time? It looked like the other night to me that time was a big idol. When there's so many children here that didn't have anybody with them. Money is an idol. Listen to this description of an idol. An idol is anything more important to you than God and the things of God. It ought to be this way, you all, and it's not. It ought to be that there's more parents here on Wednesday night to celebrate save children's lives and see what their children learn about Jesus Christ than any ballpark could ever hold. Amen. And I love sports. Amen? Amen? I love sports, but it's got to have its proper place. Entertainment. I quoted you this scripture the other day. Do you know the average age of of men that spend more time playing games on their phone than any other age in America? 38 years old. 38 years old. And I knew it would get quiet. Sex, comfort. Boy, do we like our comfort. Amen? I like my comfort. Me and Miss Alice, we got us a double recliner. We sit in it and we can hit that last click. Both our bare feet are sticking up, and I got a fan on the floor, and I turn it up, and it hits the bottom of my feet. And I, it's like I'm in a frigidaire, man. I've got it made. I like to be comfortable. Amen? Amen. But when our comfort takes over to the point that we can't swing ourselves into the shower or wherever, whatever you do to get and come worship the very one that saved your soul, we're too comfortable. You know what? I, you know what I see God doing with America. I see Him chastising us. Yeah. He's chastising us because we are too comfortable. And our phones, oh Lord! Can we just do a whole sermon on phones today? How many of us are to the point that nothing's going on but yet all day long? Did anybody call me? Did anybody text me? It should be. I'm just as guilty as everybody else. Man, I'm always looking for bargains. And I'm also watching what you all are putting on Facebook. Amen? <laughs> don't think I'm not keeping up with you. You can talk bad about me, but don't talk bad about any of God's children. In this congregation, I'm watching. Has that, has that, has that taken over the place of you reading the Bible? And get, well, Brother Mike, wait a minute. You can get Scripture on there. Yes, I know you can those of you that are doing it, it could be used for that. Colossians 3, 5, and 6 tells us this. Mortify, in other words, put to death your members, your, your body. That doesn't mean that you hurt yourself, but I mean you put what you want to do out of the way and put what God has called you to do in its place. Mortify your members which are on earth, fornication and cleanliness, inordinate affection. Evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. You know, it, it, as I noticed the other night, the, the di difference in the number between the children versus the parents, I thought these parents, and I hope I, I know not all of them, I know some of you couldn't be here, but some of these parents, and it may be you today. You're not addressing the things in the Word of God that your children are watching on television when they see same-sex couples in every commercial that you can possibly see. 
And you sit there silent and you don't address that with your child. Say, son, let's turn it off. Let me read into you what the Bible says about homosexuality. Amen. And I know everybody's throwing a fit about COVID and this Delta variant. Yes, these are real things. But how many parents have addressed how many babies have been aborted in that same amount of time and we've kept our mouths shut? Right. That breaks my heart. It's wrong. Amen. It's wrong. We can learn from children. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 18, verses 1, said the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? And automatically what Jesus did in verse 2, it said that He said a child right in the middle to give an example of who's most important because the disciples have got a little, a little high-headed, I think. So Jesus said, I'm going to put this in perspective for you. Jesus used a child to represent salvation in verse 3. He said, Verily I say to you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean to you? It means you, can, you are totally helpless when it comes to your salvation. You're just like a little child. You cannot save yourself. Amen. And you have to depend on Him. Just like your children, those of you that are parents, just like your children depend on you for the, the very food that you put in their mouth. He said, unless you, unless me, unless I, unless mom and dads say, you know, I, I've never been saved. I need Christ in my heart. And I can't save myself. I can't do anything except ask you. That's where He wants you to be. So you can be saved. A couple of weeks ago in Lexington, Kentucky, a place called Christ Embassy Church. They're remodeling that church. And it's where my daughter goes. They're remodeling that the entire place is being remodeled. So for the entire month of July, they've been outside. Hot. Amen. They chose to come and worship anyway. But here's what happened. They have a group of children in children's church. I think it was, it was more than 20 children. I do know this fact. And these children, they had a place set aside for them that they would go to in a nearby park. They'd walk a distance from their, where they're remodeling the church. So they walk up and go to this little pavilion, little overhang there that they can go in there. The teacher can sit down and teach them about Jesus Christ. But what always happens is that there's always a security team that goes up into the park to make sure there's no needles, no drugs, no alcohol, no stuff left laying around that a child doesn't need to see. So they go up and make sure that everything's good, that they can go back and say, children, it's safe. We're going to walk you from here up to the pavilion and have children's church. When they walked up there a couple of weeks ago, there was a family, there was a mom and dad and a grandparent. And there was an 11-year-old autistic boy there. One balloon. Two gifts. So they walked over to us and said, what, what's going on here? You know, we uh, normally have this for our children's church. Well, it's our little boy's 11th birthday. And nobody came. Nobody came. It broke their heart. They marched back to where the children were at and told the kids What's happening with him? The children said, I wrote it down, I put it in quotations. How about we give him a party? Amen. Amen. How about we be his friends today? Right. So everybody got out of their comfort zone. Everybody goes up. And somebody ran and got pizza. Somebody ran and got cake. And that little rascal had more gifts than he could ever possibly open. And here's what he said. This is the best birthday ever. Amen. Amen. 
I tell you that story to let you know that God can use an 11 year old autistic boy to set a church's heart on fire. Can you imagine what that's doing with that family now that this church pitched in that had other plans? Ain't it good when we got other plans and Jesus said, here's what I'm fixing to do in your life. I'm going to do something today that you didn't expect. And God used that little boy. Oh, wow. I like that stuff. Amen. I think about fell over here. I don't need to fall anymore. No, you don't. But listen to me, don't ever discount young people. Right. Don't ever discount what God can do with you. Yeah. And as adults, and sometimes in your loneliest moment, just like that little boy, God's going to send somebody mm-hmm. and give you an opportunity to change other people's lives. Yeah. And I know you don't see it then because you're stuck in misery, you're stuck in anger and disappointment like that little boy was in his family. And now, I pray for that little boy's salvation Amen. and his family that they will eventually belong to a bigger family than they could ever imagine. The whole family of God. Amen. I don't know what your need is today, but I know there's some moms and dads somewhere that are listening to the sound of my voice, whether you're here or you're watching via YouTube or Facebook. That it's time that you man up and it's time that you woman up. You say, God, I want to be the parent that I need to be and I'm going to start taking an interest in my child's spiritual life. <laughs> and I'm willing to admit that I was, I've been wrong. And maybe the reason you've been wrong is because you've never been saved yourself. Listen to these scriptures as we close. In the book of John, chapter 3. Verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. How many of you here have, have, a, have a child? Raise your hand if you have a child. Keep it up. Would you give them away for the sin of every person in this building? <coughs> Let them be put to death. They be put to death and save the whole world sin. Would you do that? No, you wouldn't do it. As much as we love, we don't love like God did and does. For God said not His Son of the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And then He adds this to it. He that believeth on Him is not condemned. If you're saved here today and you've accepted Christ, you're not condemned. But then He adds this at the end. This is important. But he that believeth not, you're condemned already because you have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ. Amen. As you sit here today, if you've never accepted Christ, you're condemned exactly where you sit. You need to be saved today. If that's you, you come. You step out on the first verse and say, Brother Mike, I've never been saved. I've never asked Christ into my heart. And man, I, I see some gigantic things going on in my life that I need to be repenting of. I need my life right. And have a home in heaven. And if you have a need today, if you're just a parent, you just there's some things that you need to let go of that, that are your idols that you really don't want to admit to. You don't have to tell them to me. Come tell them to Jesus Christ. He'll forgive you. Make Him your eye. Make Him who you look to. Make Him who you put first instead of all these other things in your life. You come today if you have a need. Do what the Spirit of God tells you to do, not what I tell you to do. Number 195. And you can have the greatest birthday ever. Amen.